Hey, so I, we're going to be in the book of First John. If you have your Bibles with you, could you turn to First John? Now, if you're wondering where First John is, I wanted to let you know. Um, if you get into the old in the New Testament, there's if you get to uh, Hebrews, and then there's James, and then there's Peter, and then there's the First John, Second John, Third John. And uh, if you want to go backwards. Uh, go to the, the last book of the New Testament, which is Revelation, and then right before Revelation is Jude, and then Third John, Second John, and First John. So it's towards the end of the Bible, and by now you should have all found it. Those of you who are on your phones, piece of cake. <laughs> Today's the final week of our sermon series entitled Renewed, and I hope that each and every one of you was able to experience some kind of renewal within your life as we walk through these last few weeks together. Um, We learned that God renews our spirit, and he renews our spirit when we repent and when we trust him to cleanse us of our sins and forgive us of our sins. A, A person who has a renewed spirit is a person who longs to be right with God and is willing to repent of sin in order to be fresh and clean of heart. And then we also learned that God offers us a renewed purpose as we trust him to guide us. Whenever we feel that we're running low on batteries or low on steam or needing to be renewed, there's only one source that suffices, only one. We have to go back to the source of all life, and that is the God of the universe. This is where we receive our God-given purpose. And then last week, we learned that God renews our love for him by us understanding the great love he has for us. Our love gets renewed for him when he reminds us of how much he loves us. To be a a Christ follower is to love God at the core of who you are. This means that all of our actions, all of our thoughts are dictated by this love. We, um, when we have God properly in place as the first thing, the first love of our life, then we're equipped to love him back and to love others as well. We have a God who is so intimately involved in our lives that we never have to resign um, resign ourselves to hopelessness and a broken life. We can all experience renewal. Today, we want to look at some communities which others have surrounded themselves with. Um, We are going to largely... You know, I'll tell you that who we are is largely a result of the people we have chosen to call friends, who we are. Um, I heard it once said that you are who you associate with. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. The choice of who you fellowship with may be one of the most important decisions that you make in your life. I want to show you a few fellowships, a few friendships, a few squads, communities that I'm sure you'd love to be a part of or have something similar to that. And let's see if you can guess who they are. On your sheet that you got this morning, there's five pictures on that sheet. Uh, Chris is going to put the first one on if you're watching online. And here's a group of friends that, uh, did anybody know what movie that is on picture number one? Call it out. Okay, those are the Despicable Me, those are the minions, right? How about picture number two? Sandlot, that's great, that's great. How about picture number three? Wow, it sounds like some of you watch a lot of movies. How about picture number four? Who are you going to call? And then finally, picture number five? Each one of these crew, we got, we got, you should go to work for television. You just... Each one of these groups of people that are, they have well-known friends who work together to accomplish all kinds of great things. I mean, who wouldn't want a group of friends that you could really count on, right? How many want a group of friends that they can count on? Everybody wants a group of friends that they could really count on. Which brings me to point number one, to choose your friends wisely. You show me your friends and it'll reveal the direction of your life. Some of us today have chosen wonderful friendships that constantly encourage you and always push you forward. A good friendship is a two-way street. In a healthy relationship, you give and you receive. A healthy community is selfless and committed to one another. However, some of us have chosen poorly. 
we find ourselves in friendships that are harmful to us. It may be, it may, it may be hard to find people who encourage you or want the best for us. Often we choose people who take advantage of us and they only look out for themselves. Maybe today you need to hear from God that he can help you experience a renewal in your community or your group of friends. The kind of people that we need to strive to be and the kind of people we want to surround ourselves with are people who keep God's commands. When we follow God's commands and we walk in his ways, it enriches our lives. And it protects us from unnecessary harm. How many know that when we follow the commandments of God, oh, we're so much safer than if we're living life on our, on our own free will? John was one of the, the 12 disciples. The 12 disciples were a crew of ordinary men who were committed to following Jesus through the ups and the, and the downs of life. The problem with most of us today, if things aren't going our way, we give up on Jesus. <laughs> but if things are going great, oh, we love Jesus. But man, they figured out that no matter how bad it got, they needed to be stuck with Jesus. They needed to be in the midst with Jesus, regardless of how tough life was or how great life was. John was very familiar with choosing fellowship of people who would live intentionally for Jesus. That's such a key to find people to surround yourself with that will live intentionally for Jesus. John wrote the book called 1 John, and within the book he reminds us of the importance of being mindful of who we walk with in life. Let me take you to 1 John chapter 2, verse 5. But whoever follows his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says that he remains in him ought himself also walk just as he walked. See, John offers a litmus test for the community in which we find ourselves. He says the mark of a committed Christ follower is someone who keeps the commandments of God. The kind of person who helps develop a strong community is someone who holds the word of God in high regard. This kind of person takes God at his word. That's the type of people you want to surround yourself with. What kind of people am, am I talking about? In Matthew 4, 17, they believe that it's important to repent of sin. You want to surround yourself with people that they believe that it's important that we repent, that we don't keep sinning, that we repent, we turn the other way, we go towards God, not away from God. They also, in Philippians 2, they believe that it's important to serve people as they serve Christ. That's so, I mean, we live in a self-centered community right now. We live in a self-centered world. Well, it's all about me. But it is so important to serve others as you serve Christ. And they believe that. In Matthew, 20, in Matthew 5, verse 23, they believe it's important to be reconciled with one another. How many know reconciliation is huge in life? It's huge, right? And how many friends do we know that say, I'm done with you? I have a friend right now who says, I'm done with you. I have a friend right now who says, yep, I'm not, you're, you're not in my life anymore. Have you ever had a friend like that that just said, so one thing happens and all of I'm done. That is so unhealthy. Then in Matthew 5, 30, uh, uh, verse 37, they believe it's important to keep their word. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Uh, uh, your word is your bond. Keeping your word honors God. How many know that when people say, I'm going to do something, they haul off and do nothing, you're just like, what? You don't get it. You don't get it. But people that you associate with should keep their word. But not only their word, but his word. And then in Matthew 21, it says they believe it's important to pray for one another. Let me tell you, I want people in my life that are going to pray for me. You know what I'm talking about? The kind of person who helps develop a strong community is someone who holds the word of God in high esteem, in high regard. The word of God is no joke. They believe it and they live by it. That's the type of people you want to surround yourself with. I want to tell you, almost two years ago, we had a tragedy at our church. A little baby boy ended up in a hospital after, a, after an unforeseen accident. And this little boy eventually, w within that week, eventually ended up going home to be with the Lord. However, about 20 people from this church drove down to a hospital in Los Angeles and sat in the waiting room, prayed, prayed, and sang worship songs and shared stories and contended for this little boy's life. Many of them made several trips to L.A. just to sit and pray and encourage this 
short little season, that week that went by, revealed one thing to Pam and, and myself, uh, that we have chosen friends wisely. We have some incredible friends. We have some incredible church family people because when you're in crisis, the people you want in your life are the people who stand on the word of God. People who trust God and his sovereign plan. You want people in your life who will always point you to Jesus. That's what you want. We all need to take um, a serious assessment of our current community. We should ask ourselves if we, if we personally and those with whom we spent most of our time are keeping God's word faithfully. Which brings me to point number two. Befriend God first. Befriend God first. What was that? Huh? A tire? Okay. So listen, nobody got shot, right? Everybody's good? Okay. Nobody's bleeding, right? All right. Praise God for that. So point number two. Apparently this was an important one. Befriend God first. Befriend God first. Just one chapter before uh, John offers the, t the test that we just read about um, that we can apply to our friendships, he points out the most important community that we should be committed to. He points out that the most important relationship we could have is with God himself. Without being committed to God in a vertical relationship, you know, this relationship that's a vertical relationship between you and God, it is very difficult to have horizontal relationships with other people. As a matter of fact, when we don't have our relationship right with God, which is our vertical relationship, our horizontal relationships, which are with people, we find significant pain. We find suffering and strain in those relationships. The bottom line is it's difficult to have a healthy relationship with others if you don't have a healthy relationship with God. Which brings me to 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. It says, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you. That God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Patty, did you share that verse today? I think you did, didn't you? I sat, I sat there and I go, oh, that's, that's the verse for today. You, you see, John tells us that, in, in, that the message that he got, he's passing it on to us. And the message is very simple. The message is that God is light. With God... All is good. He's goodness. And with him, he's able to expose everything and anything. There is no darkness in God at all. He is trustworthy and he always does what, it's, what is right. John tells us that if we want to be in fellowship with God, if we want to be a friend with God, then we must be careful to walk in light as he walks in light. We need to walk in the light. He invites us to live our lives in full exposure of God's goodness. He, we can't claim to live in community with God and yet walk in darkness while we live in sin. That makes us liars and the truth is not in us is what the scripture says. A friendship with God will expose dark corners of our lives. Oh man. Some people don't want to expose those dark corners, huh? But a friendship with God will expose those things and it will allow us to remove anything that should not be present. How many, how many can think of some things that should not be present in our lives right now? How many can think of some things that they want to get rid of in our lives right now? How many have lived in a, in a life of, of where you're just like going, gosh, I hate living this way. Anybody ever, I, I just hate living this way. And, 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 and here we are in this place, but we hide it up. We hide it. Light is the key component to renewal in our lives. It's the key component. Without light, the darkness allows brokenness and sin to remain hidden. Let me tell you, brokenness and sin should not remain hidden. Brokenness and sin should be brought to light. It reminds, it reminds me of if you've ever tried to rid yourself of pests or, or rodents in a home. Anybody ever, any ever anybody have an issue with that where you're just trying to get rid of them in your house? You know, nobody wants to raise their hand, but it's true. we all deal with it. Come on. <laughs> Come on. This is the, this, get, bring it to the light, people. Bring it to the light. Back in 1979, Yes, I know many of you weren't even born then. But back in 1979, I moved into my parents' rental house. They had a house on the avenue. 
uh, on Sunnyway Drive, 68 Sunnyway Drive. And I live in, in the, the family that lived before me had lived there for many years. And I was going to use it. I was going to fix it up. And I was going to use the rental money to go to college. So this family had lived there for, gosh, uh, years. And um, they weren't real tidy. And so when I moved into the house, uh, there was this door that went from the living room to one of the bedrooms, to the master bedroom. And if you left the door alone, the door would always swing shut. It would always just, there was a tilt on it or somehow where the door would just automatically go to close. Well, this family decided that they didn't want that to happen and they wanted that door open. So instead of having to always try to open the door, put a door stop, they put a latch behind the door and they latched the door to the cabinet behind it so the door would never shut. And I quite frankly believe that the entire time they lived there, they never opened that door. And why do I believe that? Because uh, when I moved in that first day, I had to use my strength to actually pull the door because there were so many spider webs behind that door it was the, the, there was stress on the door, and as I as I pulled the door open, and I felt the sh- the, the shredding of the spider webs, I looked behind, it and there was spider webs running all over. Spiders running all over the place. Spiders. The house had roaches. The house had rodents. There was there was little there were mice running around. It it was it was gross, but you you know what? Uh, it was my first night, and. I am going to stay in my new home. I'm, I'm, I'm committed to stay in that house. So I went to bed, and all of a sudden, man, I, I, I don't know what time in the morning. It was dark in the morning, but I'm feeling st- stuff run across my face. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm doing this, man, and I'm, I'm trying, oh, what's on me? And I get up, and I go turn the light on, and as soon as I turn the light on, roaches running everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> pretty gross, huh? <laughs> you know, when God is light and we walk with him, we're able to see clearly our sinful attitudes and dark thoughts. Like the roaches, they're brought to light. In order for us to become all God has desired for us to be, these sinful attitudes and dark thoughts need to be brought to light. They must be exposed They must be confronted. They must be dealt with. I've heard it said that a good friend stabs you in the front. (laughs) When we walk with God in the light, we invite him to clean us up. That we will be renewed and become an even better addition to any community he places us in. Listen, there are things in my life that were hidden for a long time. And when they were exposed... It wasn't comfortable. It, matter of fact, it was painful. But there's freedom in exposure. There's freedom when you walk in the light. When you walk in the darkness, there's always bondage. Always bondage. There's always, some, there's always the enemy telling you what? Oh, don't tell anybody. Don't tell. You don't want anybody to know that. But when it's exposed, it's brought to the light and you can live in total freedom. Which brings me to point number three. Walk with others in light. Walk with others in light. John adds to this idea of having fellowship with God and points out that if we walk in the light with God, then we can have a better and healthier relationship with others. If we look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, it says, But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his, uh, blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. A healthy community, a strong group of friends begins with a deep connection to God. And that connection allows for a genuine and beautiful friend, fellowship with others. In Mark chapter 8, some people in Bethsaida brought a blind man before Jesus. The Bible says that they brought the blind man before Jesus. They brought him because he was blind. Blind people have to be brought. He didn't stumble upon Jesus. He didn't Google Jesus' location. He was brought 
because he was blind. I want to remind you that blind people cannot find anything. You didn't find Jesus. Jesus found you. That's the power of gra the grace of God. Before we even knew that we needed God, grace was already working in our heart. He was already moving. He found you. You didn't find him. Check it out. He was never lost. You were. <laughs> so I want to thank God that these people brought him to Jesus. They brought him to Jesus. Most people, get before they get saved, they don't even know that they need Jesus. How many know? How, you didn't even know that you needed Jesus before you got saved, you know? They know they, they know they need something. Most people know that they need something, but they don't know that the answer is Jesus. Those people... They need to be brought to Jesus. The people who brought the blind man to Jesus realize that it's their responsibility to bring him, but it's Jesus' responsibility to heal him. See, they had the wisdom to know that the healing was on Jesus, but the bringing was on them. So this blind man, this man, he was blind. And because he was blind, he was experiencing the helplessness of having no vision. Helplessness is a byproduct of being blind. The burden that the blind carry is the void of their vision. They now rely on the voices of those around them. And whatever the people around you say is truth, you got to accept it because what else are you going to do? Research it? No, you're blind. You're completely vulnerable to the voices around you. And that makes those speaking to you incredibly powerful. Because they can't tell him anything. They can tell him anything they want to tell a blind person. You know, they can, he's got to believe it. He's blind, he can't see. They can tell him he's got red hair even when his hair's black. They can tell him that he's got an ugly face. They can tell him, give him a cup of poison and say it's a new drink from blenders. They can tell him the world is flat. They can tell them that God doesn't exist. They can tell them that you came from monkeys. Whatever they say, they got to believe it because they're blind. This is the human condition. We are vulnerable to the voices that surround us. That is why your association, your community, your friendships are so critical. If you look at your closest friends, your closest friendships, would you say that they make you more like Jesus? Do your closest friends encourage you to make choices and decisions you're proud of? When we walk in the light of God, we have nothing to hide. We're able to be honest and open with our friends. Can you really bring serious matters that are in your life to your community for help? Can you, can you really do that right now? Do you get a sense that you're having to keep some of who you truly are from your community because maybe they would be offended or, or angered or disappointed. Maybe today, you know you want to walk in the light, but your community may feel a little dark. It doesn't have to stay that way. You could begin to ask God to bring renewal to your community, renewal to your friendships, renewal to your, your, your group of friends. Or just maybe, oh, check this out, or just maybe, you could be the catalyst for renewal in your community by letting God do a work in you and let the light shine through you so others can see it. Sometimes it just takes a little change and the whole community can be renewed. You know, there's a story of a, a low-income com uh, low community in Mexico that was riddled of, of violence and crime. The city had tried for years to control the danger for families who lived there. And it wasn't until this city decided to allow a small crew of artists to paint the city like a rainbow. 200 homes and numerous blocks were changed from a dirty white paint to vibrant colors. The most interesting thing happened. If you look at this picture, it's on the screen, but those of you have to go back and watch it online, but it's this beautiful city this, this group of houses, 200 houses, that they went up and they painted like a rainbow. And if you look down from it, all you see is this beautiful piece of art. All the houses were together painted like a rainbow. It was 
Amazing. You know what happened? Violence dropped. Crime dropped. The city became a safe haven. All because of a little paint. All because of some paint. A little bit of change and the community was renewed. Which brings me to my final point this morning. Your life could be the key to renewal. Your life could be the key to renewal. You can be cleansed of all your sins. Your community can be cleansed of all your sins. It happens only one way, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, we were never meant to live alone. We were never meant to be alone. We were always meant to live in community. God's intention has always been for us to walk with Him by the power of the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus Christ. We were always meant to find strength and encouragement by walking in the light alongside others. We find strength when we're in fellowship with God. Then our fellowship with others strengthens. And at that point, we can offer hope to others whom we come in contact with. Your life could be the light that someone else needs to see. Your light. And that could light their way to the truth of what Jesus sacrificed for them. Maybe today you have two choices to make. Maybe today you need to begin to pray and intentionally search for a renewed community in order for you to live more in line with, with God. Maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's your prayer this morning. Maybe you have to look and take inventory of who you're associating with and, and pray to God that He'll bring renewal to that community or find you a community that you will be encouraged and they'll help you and shape you to be more like Jesus. Or two, maybe today you need to recognize that your life can be a light to someone else. Maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's the ticket. Who can you share the good news of Jesus' love with? Maybe you're the catalyst. Maybe you're the light. Maybe you're that little bit of paint in that community that's going to transform your whole group of friends. And I know what some of you are thinking right now. You're thinking, me? <laughs> and may I remind you that the gospel overcomes your past. I think that the most consistent lie men and women believe is that you're too jacked up or you've gone too far or you've made too many mistakes or there's no way that God can use you, save you, or forgive you. That you're the only person in human history who has pushed the boundary so far. <laughs> uh, can I just tell you? I would just lovingly tell you to get over yourself. You're, you're not that good. Not even at sinning, okay? But look at how awful I am. Yeah, well, it's not about you. It's about how awesome he is. In fact, it is the habit, if not the consistent, consistent practice of God, to pull from the fringes of darkness his brightest lights, brothers and sisters. That's his preference. To take that which was once dark and shine bright through them. If you only know the full, if you only knew the full testimonies of some of the staff or most of the staff, the people that you trust to shepherd you and love you and guide you and encourage you in the Lord, it would blow your mind of the transformations that have taken place in our lives. See, the glory of God is that you can't out sin His grace. But you don't know me. Look, bro, I don't, need, I don't need to know you. You don't know where I've been. I don't need to know where you've been or what you've done. I know that there's a whole bunch of men and women that are in the Bible that would chuckle at what you think has gone too far. The gospel has the power to take what was old and make it new. It has the power to take what is dark and shine light in order that the darkness be removed. With that said, the first thing is the light of Jesus in your life. The first thing that we need to talk about, if you have never done this, is to get the light of Jesus, you need to accept Jesus. In order to have the light that I'm talking about, the light that shines through where you can transform communities, where you can transform your quadrant, your group of friends, your gang, let me tell you, you need to have the light of Jesus. And the only way you get the light of Jesus is by accepting him as your Lord. That's it. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. It says that anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I don't care what you did, how long you did it, how long it's been that you've done it, how soon ago you did it. It, don't, it doesn't matter. He says all you got to do is confess his name. Jesus is Lord. And you have just 
you have just received him as your Lord and he's forgiven you of all your sins. You repent from all your sins. You're, you're free. You're, you're a child of God. You enter into the kingdom of heaven and you have a light shining so bright. And I'll tell you what, he takes, he takes where you lived in all of that darkness and he transforms community with your testimony. Because how are we saved? By the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Come on now. You got, you all got a testimony. You all got something. Man, and the deeper and the darker and the ugliest things that you did, gosh, bring light to that so God can use that. God can use that. Let me tell you, all the things that you went through, all the trauma, all the tragedy, all the, all the beatings, all the whatever you went through in your life is not wasted because God will use it for his glory. You have a powerful testimony. Church family, I want you to pray right now. And if, and if that was you and you wanted to receive the Lord, man, please tell me after service. Text us, uh, email us, go online. Tell us that you received the Lord. We want to follow up with you. We want, we want to connect with you. We want to walk through this with you. And, and church family, I, I want you to start thinking about something. Who in your life, who in your group of friends, who in your fellowship do you need to pray about going after? Who do you need to encourage and to love on? Those those that are suffering right now, those that you think, man, that dude's a jerk. Yeah, he probably is. She probably is because they need Jesus, brothers and sisters. That's what they need, and they need you to deliver the message. God put you on this earth. Once you get saved, he don't take you. Why didn't he take you? Because there's other people that need to hear the gospel. So you're in people's lives for a reason. So if you think they're a jerk, go to work. Start pouring out the love of God because he put it in you. Pour it out for them. Listen, here's the greatest thing you could do is share Jesus with someone that doesn't know who Jesus is. Share Jesus with someone who doesn't understand the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is one of the greatest things you could do and that's why you are left on this earth to continue to share God's word. <laughs>